Hey folks, thanks for tuning in to Extreme Reloading. You know, I'm just about ready to head out to the range and this is going to be our third session out at the range where we're testing the effect of various neck tensions. And by the time we get this one finished, we'll have fired 75 rounds downrange across five different types of previously prepared ammo. Now, just to set this up real quick, once again, as a reminder, I'm using 168.4 grain Sierra tipped match kings. That's weight sorted bullets. I'm using very carefully prepared Federal Champion brass, where three of those groups that I'm calling Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie, or A, B, and C, actually ended up with the same neck tension of three thousandths of an inch. However, each of those was prepared with different neck size bushings from my Hornady neck sizing match grade uh, neck sizing die. Set Delta has only one one thousandth of an inch of neck tension and it was also prepared with a different bushing of those Hornady uh, dies. Set Echo is my control. Now, I didn't do anything special with Echo, any of those rounds that, that is. In other words, I have the Federal Champion Brass. I prepared the flash holes and weight sorted it, just like I did all the rest, but I did nothing special at all with those necks. It ended up having a two thousandths of an inch neck tension, and it doesn't matter if you specifically prepare the necks or your cases for a specific neck tension or not, they all have a specific neck tension and we measure that and we can determine that and that's what I'm doing uh, in this instance. Now this trip out to the range, I have a different firing order and I'm going to be shooting this starting off with our control Echo, then moving to Charlie, Delta, Bravo, and finally, Alpha. And once again, I'm going to have a little bit of fun while I'm out at the range. And what I've done is I have picked up one of these AccuTac. Uh, it's a precision bipod for my Ruger precision rifle. Well, it doesn't have to go just on my Ruger precision rifle. It'll go on to any rifle with a Picatinny attachment. This is their F-Class Generation 2 bipod. In other words, it's the FC-G2 uh, bipod. And, you know, I haven't shot off of a bipod in quite a few years. Um, I had bad experience with bipods previously. I put a bipod uh, on my 220 Swift Ruger No. 1. And that rifle kind of got me into precision shooting. It's really an excellent rifle. But in those days, um, of course, the Ruger No. 1 doesn't have Picatinny's. Uh, but in those days, the way that you hooked a bipod onto a rifle was using the sling swivel stud in the front. And so that's how I had that set up. And, and I, I put that rifle up and just moved away from the rifle for a little bit to get some ammo or something of, the, of that nature. And one of the legs collapsed and dumped the whole thing over off to the side. And Gee, I, I didn't think too much of it. It was wobbly. It didn't seem to really lock into place. And, and I was absolutely convinced that it didn't help my shooting at all. It just was a pain to even bother using it. But things have changed over the decades. Uh, and some of these new bipods are really quite impressive. So this is the bipod. And here is the Picatinny attachment point. And this part right here faces the shooter. And these are my controls. So I can unlock this here. And that allows me to cant the rifle as needed and then to lock it back down and this here allows me to traverse
So let me tell you, bipods have come a long way. And of course, I have different leg positions that can be used. Same on the other side, obviously. And I can extend these legs a bit, drop them right back into position. Kind of nice. Now, the, my concern with this is that doesn't really elevate very much off of the ground. Uh, so I don't know um, how it's going to go. And my concern, of course, is that that 200 yard range, 200 longer range that I shoot at, uh, has an incline uh, to it. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot this time at 100 yards. That is a very flat set of bays. There's several of those and they're all very flat. So this will allow me to uh, e easily to use this and kind of get used to shooting off of, of a bipod. I'm probably going to be a little bit rusty, uh, but uh, it should turn out okay and be fun. A good refresher for me nonetheless. So I am ready to head out to the range. See you out there. Felt pretty darn good. Pretty darn good. One last one. Ow! I think I might have pulled that one low. Good. Oh, threw that one high. I don't think I did that though. Felt good. That one felt really good.
real good. Nice, one more. Well, in hindsight, I almost regret testing the bipod today at 100 yards, but not really. I mean, I'm shooting because it's fun, and this is part of the fun of it all. The only problem that I really encountered as far as our neck tension experiment is concerned uh, is the fact that I clearly pulled one of those shots when I was firing the second group I call C or Charlie. And I also suspect I pulled one other in the very first group that I was shooting. And that's, that's really on me, of course, and probably my unfamiliarity uh, with uh, using the bipod. The bipod, by the way, works pretty darn well. Uh, it is quite low, uh, and so even at 100 yards, I had to uh, I had to kind of hunker down pretty low to get a good cheek weld, my kind of standard procedure. I've gotten so accustomed to shooting off the bag, uh, but I think really if I had gone up to the 200-yard bay, um, I would have had uh, more problems getting uh, a good cheek weld. So that was a good decision to, to do that. As far as the results go on target, um, what I'm going to need to do to make this fair is to remove one of those um, rounds from each of the groups. I mean, I'm clearly going to remove it from group Charlie, but then to make it fair for all the other groups, I will remove one, the furthest uh, flyer or outlier in the group. And so, in this case, we're going to be using a four-shot group. Not a real big problem, uh, statistically, because I'm not concentrating on just the results from this session. I've got two other sessions, ten other rounds uh, already in the books, uh, and this one, instead of being 15 rounds, uh, this is going to make it 14 rounds as far as our precision uh, is concerned. Uh, all 15 rounds, by the way, all five rounds from each of the um, groups that I fired today, will be used in the muzzle velocity consistency part of our experiment. So we've got a really nice sample size there of 75 rounds. The sample size on our precision, though, is actually quite small. We don't have 75 or even 74 or 70 rounds in total used to calculate uh, MOA or precision. What we have is 15 groups. And so now our sample size, as far as precision is concerned, is quite a bit smaller. But let's look at the results that came in from today. What we're looking at right now is a graph of MOA, minute of angle, including all five rounds fired for all five groups. And you'll notice uh, in this order, A, B, C, D, and E, that C, the center one, really did terrible. And you heard me uh, on video while we were shooting that I, I know I pulled that one badly. Now I should also note the importance of using MOA. See, using MOA, I can compare groups fired at 100 yards like we did today against those groups that I fired at 200 yards in the previous two sessions. So I'm not using an inch measurement of extreme spread. I'm doing that conversion to MOA, and that really allows me to make those comparisons at any range that I want. Knowing 
that at further and further ranges, I am going to be introducing more and more shooter error into it uh, than I am at shorter ranges. But I think that's very, very minimal between 100 and 200 yards. So now when we look at the results from this session only, with four rounds fired in firing order, we see a very common trend popping up there. In, the, in fact, three of the five groups came in with a 0 0.92 or just under one MOA. And that's Echo, Charlie, and Bravo. And then looky here, set Delta came out of nowhere. I mean, Delta D has been doing so poorly in all of our previous uh, sessions out at the range that I kind of had discounted it that there was just not too much to it. Uh, remember that set Delta has a very, very light neck tension of only one one thousandth of an inch applied to it. But today, Delta did the best. And one of our previous leaders, Alpha, did the worst. When we put it back into alphabetical order, uh, we can look at it this way. And here we're seeing the applied neck tension and also in parentheses there, the um, bushing that was used during neck sizing. And recall again that set echo or E was not neck sized with the Hornady die, but rather with my Forster competition neck sizing die. But once again, what's more important is not any individual results from a single session out at the range, but rather the cumulative results. And now we really have all three range sessions in the books. And what we're looking at now is a cumulative graph of precision measured in MOA. And we're now seeing this familiar trend where A, C, and E are outperforming groups or set B and D. This has kind of been the growing trend uh, that we've been watching over the past two sessions out at the range. Uh, and if I add the cumulative average in a blue line, and the cumulative median in the dashed gray, grayish black line, we can see that statistically A, C, and E are doing or performing better than the average. And here now we're looking at a table of the MOA group sizes for sessions one, two, and three, and then that average uh, for each of the sets, as well on the far right, the average uh, across each session. Now sometimes we look at data and we might want to jump to a conclusion that, hey, this is very different from that. And as long as we can measure this and that, and we have enough measurements of this and that, then we can compare this versus that statistically. So when you were in school, you might remember some teachers grading on the curve. Well, what that meant is that the majority of students were going to be considered average students, and they were going to get a grade of C, that kind of average grade. Very few students who performed better than the average student were kind of off on the tail of that bell-shaped curve and they received an A. Very few of the students who performed poorly fell on the opposite side of that bell-shaped curve and they received an F or a failing grade. Now that entire concept comes up or is derived from what's called the theorem of central tendency. Big fancy words there, but what it means is that things really are pretty similar in nature, in the world. 
So if we measure the height of the average American male, let's say, uh, of all American males, let's say, we'll come up with an average, and that average is a pretty good indicator of the height of American males. There will be some really tall people, and they're going to fall on the tail of that bell-shaped curve, and there will be some very short people that are fall on the far side, the opposite side of that same curve. So it's very common that we take the main part of that bell-shaped curve, let's say 90% of that bell-shaped curve, and we call it normal. And these measurements that we make can be for students' grades, can be for people's heights, can be for group sizes, and it can be for muzzle velocities and the standard deviation of those muzzle velocities. So what we're interested in now, even though our graph looks like A, C, and E are performing differently from B and D, are they actually performing differently? Now I can use a statistical test called ANOVA, Analysis of Variance, uh, and that test will tell us with a p-value if the things that we're testing are similar to one another, they fall under the main part of that bell-shaped curve, or if they're actually different from one another, where one of those measurements is sitting in one of the tails, let's say. So I compared the group size, MOA, for each of our sets across the three firing sessions. And what I found is that there is no statistical difference at all between any of these, even when I use what's called a pairwise ANOVA, in other words, A versus B, A versus C, A versus D, and so on and so forth. No difference whatsoever. In fact, what's interesting with this analysis is the fact that set Charlie is considered statistically nearly identical to set Echo. And that is interesting because they both used the same neck size to begin with, that 0 0.334. But the problem with comparing minute of angle or a group sizes statistically is that we have really a very, very small sample size. Within a given group, we only have three different observations. So that's why I wanted to also take a look at the consistency of our muzzle velocities and at the muzzle velocities themselves. So now we have a much larger sample size overall N, our sample size, number is 75, and even within a given set, we have 15 samples or observations. And so when I run that same analysis of variance and a pairwise analysis of variance, things get really interesting. And here we see statistically set B, Bravo and set D, Delta, are different from A, C, and E. And they're different in a bad way. They have higher, as we saw, uh, group sizes or larger group sizes, and they have different muzzle velocities with higher standard deviation of those muzzle velocities. So remember earlier, I talked about the 90% under that bell-shaped curve being considered normal. Well, if we have 100% of a population of all the different measurements in the world, and we remove 90%, and we say that that's just normal stuff, well, that leaves 10% in the tails, 5% on either side. So when we're looking at probability values, if we find a value less than 5% or 0.05, then we know 
that that thing we're comparing is sitting in the tails, and it is different. So here we're seeing the table of my pairwise analysis of variance, and now we can clearly see that B is pretty much always acting differently, as is D. So, I'm going to be doing one more session, and I'm calling this the ACE session. In other words, I'm going to be loading, once again, the same federal brass, but only sets A, C, and E. And the five rounds that I'll be firing from each of these will use the brass that performed best previously. In other words, when I load set A once again, I will use the brass from session two. When I load C or Charlie, I'll be using the brass from session one. And for Echo or E, I'll be using the same exact brass from our final firing session. That's when each of those performed their best. So I'm taking the best of the best and we're going to put it head to head to see if we can break this gridlock and get a reliable understanding of the effect of neck tension. You know, this has been a difficult experiment because we're not seeing absolute consistency across the board on each of these firing sessions. Yes, some of that could have been induced by me, the shooter, uh, but I think that that was pretty minimal. So I hope you'll be tuning in for our next episode of Extreme Reloading, heading back out to the range, shooting three groups in what I'm calling our ACE test. See you then.